So regarding the, the cesium uh, atom uh, clocks, is it correct to say that they're the most widely used these days? That's absolutely true. And, and the cesium clock, in fact, is still the definition of time. Uh, the optical atomic clock, in order to be redefined as a time standard, will still take a few more years. And the reason is very simple. There's incredible technical infrastructure. All the GPS, all the satellite communications, mm. all the country-to-country -country co connections, and so on. It's all based on microwave standards. The optical standards is now easily a thousand times better in terms of precision-wise or in, in terms of accuracy, maybe two orders of magnitude, magnitude better. So you can say, why don't you redefine the time now based right. on optical atomic clocks? Well, I, I must say the optical atomic clocks is, has been largely a research effort. And only re very recently, people start to make a comparisons between optical atomic clocks between different laboratories and eventually between different countries. It's a little bit easier to do in Europe just because of the density of the different countries, of different national labs are much higher than in the U.S. There's only one. It's all, everything is in border. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, but also in Asia. And uh, so these are important where different countries need to compare their standards because after all, it's a universally defined time. Everybody should agree. Uh, and uh, and our, our clocks should agree with each other. And that, that will take time to make these comparisons just because we don't have infrastructure, readily built infrastructure to compare the optical clocks. They are much more precise than microwave clock. And so you cannot just use GPS. They mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to do the job. You have to build fiber networks. Uh, you have to be able to maybe point lasers from point A to point B and start to demonstrate technologies that can transfer time at a 10 to minus 18 level from one position to the other. So are they like more expensive or is it more difficult to scale up comparing to cesium ones? Or I don't know. Oh, I would just happy that, you know, cesium atoms is already, the GPS gives us, what is it, like t meter, tens of meters resolution? Yeah. And then yes. it's like good enough uh, yes. for the technology. Yeah. Um, so the, you're touching on a really important point. I, I think uh, it's not necessarily true optical atomic clock is more complex than, than the cesium clock. And oftentimes, you're pushing the very best is different from making it practical for everyone. Pushing the absolute best often involves the more complex apparatus. And I, I would say the very best cesium fountain clock is fairly complicated. Mm -hmm. And you have this large chamber where the atom has to be thrown up and come down. And from that perspective, optical atomic clock is actually simpler. Um, and it, even though it offers much better performance. And, and it, but in terms of the portab portability, laser is actually not very robust, right? This is the one thing what people need to make sure the lasers are robust and also small. Um, microwave technology is much more mature. Uh, and and uh, when you... So when you say, I want to make a portable system, here's another design consideration. How much would you like to be at the state of the art level versus compromising it a little bit with the good benefits of making the system much more compact, much more robust, that it can be transported and so on. And that's really, is, is a field that's, on, that's robustly ongoing right now. There's a commercialization starting to come up. In fact, I mentioned iodine clock. The iodine clock is not even called atom-based. It's just using relying on vapor cells of iodine. And the reason why that they are selling commercially now is because they're offering a, something that's potentially better or at least equal with a maser, but it was a performance, but it was a much smaller footprint. Mm -hmm. So that, that starts to become really useful. And, and also, when you talk about how useful is a clock, that question is that really has multi layers. You know, you can say, I want to have a clock to eventually be able to see space-time ripples, you know, eventually be connect on how quantum physics is being influenced by gravity. I do believe as we continue to push on this, we'll be able to start to explore these very fundamental sectors of space-time and how quantum physics and gravity is connected. Because you have to make measurements to be able to you, can, you cannot just rely on a mathematician to come up with these different kind of string theories. You have to explore, right? And a clock is one Verifies. of the best tools to, to, to explore. And you never know what you can do when you go down to the clock at 10 minus 30, what are you going to find out? Hmm. Uh, so this is a, what drives me the most in terms of 
really pushing that frontier. And, and one of the experiments we recently published was, okay, I can move my clock by a couple hundred microns, essentially on the scale of a human hair, or maybe a little bit bigger than the, a single human hair. And you can start to see time is different because of Einstein's general relativity. And what if we pushing that by another factor of 100, then you will start to see, oh, time is different on one de Broglie wavelength of your atom. <laughs> so how do you write down this uh, Schrodinger's equation when you have psi xt, but x determines what time t is, depending on the local gravitational field. <laughs> and stuff like this would allow you to start to see, okay, how the quantum coherence, you know, vertically positioned uh, uh, quantum system might look different from horizontally positioned quantum system. It's not a quantum gravity, you know, that would take a much more decades to go down to see things. But when you want to start to make those connections, mm -hmm. that requires much better clocks than we, we currently have. But then you mentioned GPS. Uh, GPS is an incredible technology, right? Everybody relies on. Uh, but if you say, well, what if we, our civilization is not just being satisfied being confined on Earth? What if we want to make the whole solar system to be to be livable place for, for the human civilization? I think sooner or later it has to happen. We cannot have just one home. <laughs> uh, so if that happens, maybe you want to have a GPS for the whole solar system. And just because of distance so expansive out there. Um, a huge the, delay in getting the signal. <laughs> the GPS may not be good enough. So yeah. you, now you need it to be really accurate because by the time you, I'm about to land on Mars, Oh, you're off by 10 meters. That signal takes a very long time. You have to be self-guided. And so from that perspective, I would say, I know there's a lot of a military aspect of time, and I'm not, I'm not really into that kind of stuff. But it's really important also, you know, you, if you say, I have a vehicle, and the GPS is gone, and that vehicle is, a, is a flying to reach certain distance, well, you have to rely on your own clock on the on that on that vehicle. So, and and the the cesium clock wouldn't be good enough. And currently, for those uh, kind of interplanetary uh, trips, like let's say what is sent like to Mars, the yeah. rovers, so they have like um, on the on the rocket. On, on the spacecraft, they, they have the, the clock. So is, yes, is that the yeah. way it works right now yeah. with like cesium clock? Yeah, those are, those are all microwave technology based, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I do think in the next coming decades and so on, I think you will start to see lasers in space. Um, I mentioned I have some dream about our silicon cavity should be sitting on the surface of the moon. <laughs> That's because there's a permanent shadow area where the temperature is very stable and there's no the vacuum is already good on its own, <laughs> and all these things, and there's no seismic noise, um, unless we hear alien footsteps. You know? <laughs> and, and so if all of that is true, you know, you start to build optical networks up there, and well, deep space navigation and so on would it be much more efficient um, with the laser beams of microwaves and so on. So, Sounds and like it, a great the, moonshot. Yeah, the, the precision is much higher, and people are already talking about putting gravitational detector in space, a LISA project. Lisa. And, and that's already requiring lasers to be able to track. If, we, if you can get the laser downstairs to be able to engineer and package it up to go to satellites, we will be able to see satellites millions of kilometers apart from each other, and it can connect them coherently. That, that means the distance between them won't be wrong by a small fraction of the laser wavelengths, picometers out of millions of kilometers. And if that comes true, you can look much further into deep space because you now you can think of your aperture of, a, of, your, of your optical interferometer is a millions of a kilometer distance. Now you maybe see the final edge of the universe. You know? <laughs>